Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the fourth Friday of the month, which means it's time for everything you need to know about heart disease with Dr. Monica Agarwal. And today we're gonna to be discussing natural ways to lower your cholesterol. In case you don't know, Dr. Agarwal is the co-author of two fabulous books, the first one is called Body on Fire. You can see that I have little pages there because I refer to it. And then a cookbook of the same name. So please welcome Dr. Agarwal to the show. It's nice to see you. Yeah, it's great to be here as always. Thanks so much. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I was we were just chatting before the show that we have a lot of doctors that have regular shows on my channel, but more cardiologists than any other specialty. So I'm curious, like, does that specialty, do you think maybe breed more vegan or plant-based eaters than maybe other specialties in medicine? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I actually would argue because, you know, all of my partners, so in, in Orlando, I'm probably, which is where I am, um, there are no cardiologists that are focused on nutrition and lifestyle. So I don't know if this is a thing, but it is interesting because Columbus and, um, you know, there are four or five of us for sure that are very adamant. I think part of it is, is that we know the data so well and how good eating plant-based is for the heart. And so it's hard not to create believers in a cardiology crew. And so even, you know, in my prevention council, part of the Amer I'm part of the uh, prevention council of the American College of Cardiology, and I'm actually the nutrition chair, uh, co-chair of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. And half of our group is plant-based. So I think that, you know, when you know the data, it's very hard to ignore it and to sort of keep going by uh, advocating to eat meat and processed foods for heart disease. I don't want to ever give credence to this person, but isn't there like some maybe well-known on social media doctor who is a cardiologist, but he's a carnivore. He follows the yes. carnivore diet. Uh, there are a few actually. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say to that. So, um, other than, um, you know, I take care of so many patients who follow these ketogenic high fat diets and, uh, they're my patients, you know, and they're my patients because they have uh, disease or, you know, we put stents in them and, you know, and I know the data, which is that, you know, yes, eating a high fat or high or low carb diet will improve your blood sugars and make you lose weight, but it won't necessarily improve your cardiovascular profile and won't certainly in your, there's so much fluctuation in your lipids um, when you eat that kind of diet. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually a big thing. And I, I see this all the time. And I think that most people who, I think that that just is one of those things about social media too, which is that you can find almost anything out there on, on the internet or on social media to agree with what you want it to say. And so I think it's very difficult to navigate. I, I don't envy people going out through the world, trying to figure out their information from Google, because there is so much uh, mess. And now with chat GPT, actually everybody thinks, oh, well, that's going to be so great. I can just type in what are the best diets or, but remember they're just extracting pieces from the internet. And so if it's out there on the internet, they just collate and synthesize it and shoot it back to you. So you could easily keep, you know, manifest, you know, purporting the same wrong information. Yeah, absolutely. So you wanted to talk about natural ways to lower the cholesterol. So what are some of the unnatural ways? Well, I think maybe the way to start this conversation is to show a picture of a blood vessel. And um, so I think that you can see my screen there. So, you know, I think that sometimes it's helpful to look at the blood vessels from beginning from sort of healthiest to unhealthiest. And so what I like people to see is in the top picture, that's a blood vessel. So it's like a big pipe, like in your plumbing. And in the, the part that touches the blood, which is where the arrow is, has a layer of cells called endothelial cells. And those endothelial cells are really important because their job is to cause the blood vessel to open and close, dilate and close. So imagine if you're trying to exercise, your heart's pumping faster because you need to get more blood to the muscles of the leg so you can run. 
but you also need to dilate or open up the blood vessel. And so the blood vessel gets dilated and then all of the blood shoots down to the rest of the body so that it gets to the muscles and you are able to exercise and run the speed you want to run. So it's really important to have a healthy endothelium, a nice, soft, spongy blood vessel, which is what the top blood vessel is. And then over time, when you have cardiovascular risk factors like high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol, you can damage those endothelial cells. So those that cell layer that's touching the blood is actually gets damaged. And then it's not as responsive to dilation or constriction, which is important when you exercise or when you move. And so, and then as those endothelial cells get damaged, then you actually get actual fissures or inside the blood vessel wall. And then your body starts bringing over platelets to heal, oh, heal the, the injury. But because they're, and it creates a scab, but if it creates a scab outside of your body, you don't care if it's two inches or 200 inches, but if it's inside a pipe and you have something that's two inches or 200 inches, it makes a whole lot of difference. And that's because you're in a circular space. And if you have a little bit of scab in there, then you are gonna build, then you're gonna block blood flow. So when you have high cholesterol on top of a scab, it attaches to the blood to that scabbed area and it becomes a full on fibrous plaque. And that fibrous plaque is what is heart disease and blocks blood flow over time. And what you can see in the third, that that fibrous plaque can become unstable, usually triggered by inflammation and that plaque can rupture and it causes an acute heart attack. And that was triggered, you know, people who classically had that problem were people like Carrie Fisher, um, James Gandolfini, uh, a lot of different people who've had plaque rupture and then had acute heart attacks and acquired stents and some who died. So I say that because I think it's important to answer your question about what are unnatural ways to bring your lipids down. So if you already have plaque in your heart, using medication to bring and stabilize the plaque and bring down your mm -hmm. cholesterol is essential. And so when I talk to you about natural ways, I want us to be very clear that people who have plaque in their heart should do both. They should be on medication and they should use natural ways to bring down their cholesterol. It's, so it's important to realize that those, those plaques need stabilization and the medications work. So when we call them unnatural ways, they are still, medications are unnatural, but they are also stabilizing and very important with loads of data to say they are beneficial. So if you have heart disease, um, being on a statin is um, in particular is extremely important, even though maybe that's quote unquote unnatural. Right. So statin medications are sort of the most common medication to bring down your cholesterol. And those are like any word with a statin on the end of it. So lovastatin, simvastatin, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, pituvastatin, those are all statins and they bring down your cholesterol. But not only do they do that, they stabilize the plaque. So they're less likely to rupture. And that's very important because people don't understand that and that statin stabilize plaque and they decrease inflammation, all of which is needed in the setting of, a, of heart disease. Do you, you normally, look at, do you know, I'm sorry, I'm just curious. Do you normally give them to your patients right away when they have high cholesterol or do you try to get them to initiate some diet and lifestyle changes first to see if it can come down without the medication? Absolutely. So if you have advanced heart disease, I'm going to do both. I'm going to give you the statin and the lifestyle changes. And that's what people know about me is that I'm always going to use everything in my armamentarium for the person who has heart disease. For the person who doesn't have heart disease, I have lots of room for time. I've got time on my side. So I will always give them a chance to work with their lifestyle first to bring down their cholesterol. And then I will only then, you know, after that we've done it a fair shake, then do we think about medication if it medications needed at all? Many people don't, you know, I think um, many people don't realize the power of their lifestyle and bringing down their numbers. For instance, I don't have high cholesterol and I never have, but when I did have it at my highest, when I didn't eat plant-based, I, um, and you compare it to what it is when I am plant-based, it drops 60 points. Wow. So you can absolutely drop you. And like I said, I don't, I don't have a cholesterol problem. So you can absolutely bring down your numbers, uh, with lifestyle change. That is really significant. And I imagine people can bring them down fairly quickly in many cases. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you could within six to eight weeks, you can bring down your, your cholesterol into a really good space. Now, the problem is, is that cholesterol is also tricky. It's not based on one moment in time. 
And just like smoking, it's how many years you smoked. And so it's also like cholesterol, it's how many years you had high cholesterol. So it's very important to, you know, to remember that we don't want you to kind of eat, treat, not only do we not want you to feed your kids bad food um, and say, oh, you know, they're young, it's okay. We don't want you to feed yourself like that either and say, oh, well, it's okay. I'm still young, it's okay. Uh, because I don't even know what that means. I mean, you see plaque in seven, eight year olds who die of cancer. Um, and so in 20, 18 year olds who die in the war. So um, there is never too early to eat uh, healthy and um, at least as much plant-based as you can. Well, you're, if you're seeing seven, well, I don't know if you see children, but if you're saying seven-year-olds have high cholesterol, does that mean seven-year-olds are going on statins? Well, that's, you know, seven-year-olds, you find plaque or fatty streaks in their, in their heart. Uh, but to answer your question, can seven-year-olds have high cholesterol? Absolutely. But the people who are seven who have high cholesterol are most likely going to have a genetic predisposition to high cholesterol, meaning they have a genetic variant where they can't break down cholesterol. Um, and so that's a very important medical problem and can be partly treated with dietary change. But almost all of those children, if they're very high, are going to end up on medicine at some point. But I take I don't take care of kids. I don't do pediatrics, but I do have some young people in my clinic because I'm because I am so because I am unique as an only lipid specialist in my town um, and very few of us in the country. And so I will sometimes see a younger person. Um, but, you know, if your cholesterol is in the mid level, I mean, there's lots of room that I can do things um, with lifestyle. It's just there are some people that you no matter what you do, you're going to get on a stat. And those are people who genetically typically genetically have a problem where they can't clear cholesterol. That's interesting. A lipid specialist. Are, are there some people, though, that for whatever reason can't tolerate the medications? And what are some of the common side effects of the medication? Yeah. So uh, um, lipid specialists, I'm, I'm board certified in cholesterol management or lipids. So um, that's a very that's sort of a unique specialty um, to answer your second question, which is, um, are there side effects? Yeah. So statins are notorious for causing side effects like muscle aches. So that's what most people complain about is that they have, again, it's very uncommon, but that is something that we see. You know, most often people think that their statins are causing muscle aches, um, but we take off the statin and they still have the muscle aches. Um, but then, yes, you can have statin induced muscle aches as a thing, um, but that's classically aches in your limb girdle. Um, and that's sort of so in your in your waist, et cetera, which is when. Um, um, and so those are the places where we often see muscle aches and statins. Other things that you can have are you can have mild abnormalities in your livers, uh, your liver, your blood sugar can mildly go, go up. Um, and some people complain of memory loss, although all of that, the memory loss issue has been debatable for years and decades and overall studies don't show that. And what we think happens is that, you know, people who have high cholesterol often develop plaque in their brain and they often have, you know, mild dementia and memory loss from the plaque they develop in their brain. But there are many medications um, now there are many medications now that are out there that are non-statin alternatives. Now, not, you know, 10 out of 10 of us should be prescribing a statin for patients with heart disease um, because that is the one medication that has 35, 40 years of data and does reduce mortality. So you're not going to, you're going to live longer um, if you take a statin, if you have known heart disease. So the patients that I think are most interested in your show and who are most interested in bringing down their cholesterol are people who are looking for those natural ways. So I think the thing to remember is, is that to give yourself a break if you and not feel bad if you can't get your numbers down with just a dietary change and lifestyle change, like it's okay. Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves um, and we're tough on ourselves, especially sometimes in this plant-based community where people can make you feel badly for not being able to bring your numbers down completely with lifestyle change. I think that you do the best you can. You really push yourself hard every day. And sometimes you're going to need medication and that's okay. Uh, and I really try to give people a space to be who they are and, you know, always pushing and challenging people to get better but also honoring the process. So 
Um, so that's that. So, you know, there's statins, there are non-statin alternatives that are out there that I use a lot of and more and more coming every day um, that are options that are really good, especially for people who have elevated lipoprotein little a, which is another atherogenic particle that is not controlled significantly by diet and is primarily genetic. Um, and so there are medications that are targeted now towards those, to those, um, to those markers. So there's a lot of stuff out there that are, that are medications. So to shift gears to the more interesting or more exciting, maybe to your audience is probably the lifestyle changes. So what I always try to tell people about cholesterol is, so what we're mostly looking for is reducing your LDL cholesterol. So L is lethal, L, H is health. So you wanna have a high HDL and a low LDL. Um, is there such a thing as too high of an HDL? Yes, probably. We're starting to see HDLs that are over a hundred that we think maybe not as protective as we once thought. The LDL is the bad cholesterol, which is the one we primarily focus on. But like I said, there are so many more markers that I check in my clinic, like apolipoprotein B, lipoprotein little a, which are specific markers that are more atherogenic than, or, or plaque causing than maybe LDL or LDL alone. So there's just more to the picture. And what we're looking for though, when we think about dietary change or what lifestyle change is, we think about that LDL. And so we'll focus on LDL primarily. And so the key to LDL is you want to make that number go down and you can get it down with a couple of things. And the, if you look at your diet first, the most important thing to do is reduce the saturated fat intake. You need to reduce the saturated fat intake. So saturated fat comes from your animal products, um, except for maybe eggs. Uh, and it comes from some plant products like avocado has a little bit of saturated fat. Some nuts have saturated fat, coconut, and coconut oil have saturated fat. So there are mostly, you're going to get your saturated fat from animal products, some plant products, um, and you want to reduce saturated fat. There is no substitute for reducing saturated fat. Every study that's out there that shows shows that if you change saturated fat to unsaturated fat, you will be better. You will live longer. Your numbers are going to be better. And so we want you to reduce your saturated fat. So where do you get saturated fat? Well, if you fry things, uh, you can get trans fats or you can get these hydrogenated fats from chem that are chemically created that we've created, which are primarily gone now in, the, in America, although there are small amounts in a lot of different foods because the uh, FDA allows a small amount. Um, and um, then there's the saturated fat, which is the next bad culprit, trans fat, then saturated. And again, you want to cut out things like red meat in particular. So you can, in a four ounce steak, you should Google the nutritional contents because you can get uh, up to like 27 grams of fat inside a, uh, a steak, uh, a piece of steak. So there's so much saturated fat in your animal products, um, especially things like red meat and cheese, which is where you're getting a load of your saturated fat. So people are say, oh no, not my cheese, you know? And so when I gave up cheese uh, 13 years ago, um, I kind of cried a little, like not cried, but I kind of felt like, oh my God, everything's being taken away from me. <laughs> You know, like there's that classic thing, but so you know, funny. I right. I hear but that I, a lot. I hear that a lot with cheese. You know, I'm I'm being allergic to dairy. That wasn't my thing for me. The sugar was the hardest, but I hear that so often that that you know, I'd rather die than give up cheese. Yeah, it's fascinating, and you know, I felt maybe that I would not that I'd rather die because I I would do anything to keep myself healthy. Um, I got three babies at home that I never want to be a you know I want to take care of as long as I can. So, but. I do think that um, that cheese was hard to give up for sure, because I think that, you know, we're built, you know, we're, we're trained to think milk does your body good. And then we do this cheese thing sort of our whole life. Um, and like, I used to eat like three cheese sticks, a glass of milk, you know, I would just like that on a daily, you know? And so I think that at first it seems so hard to give up cheese, but I mean, you know, I haven't had cheese in four, 13 years. Like why? Yeah, it may be hard, but I mean, having better health is totally worth it. You know, like not feeling painful, having pain or not having uh, to take medication. Why there for me that that's a no brainer. Cause you, you but, actually had something, you know, you had a significant reason. I, I'm not, I, you know, we started doing this show monthly, but I'm 
I'm not sure everybody is familiar with your story. Yeah, so uh, you know, I have um, a debil. I was told I had a debilitating form of rheumatoid arthritis that I had. It was pretty advanced. Um, my numbers, inflammatory markers were pretty bad, and I was told that I needed to be on medications for the rest of my life, um, and that there were no cures. Um, and so, you know, I I went down. I started taking medication, and I went down a path of learning about my lifestyle. Um, and I outlined the story. I mean, it's much more unhappy and less glamorous in my, um, which I write in my book, Body on Fire and tell that story. But that was a, that was a very dark time of my life. Um, but it took me, um, once I started learning how to use your lifestyle to heal your body and learned about the microbiome and inflammation, I, it changed everything. You know, it changed my whole life. So, um, I don't know. I, you know, for me, I, people, you know, I did a talk one day and they, they, they sent me a shirt actually with my quote, which was that if, if I knew that eating dirt was good for me, I would eat it. You know, like I have no hesitation taking, if it, if I knew it was good, I, I would do, I just do what it needs to be done because to me it's worth everything. So reducing saturated fat. So that's where you want to look at. So you want to be thinking about all of your animal products, which primarily have saturated fat, like I said, except for eggs and um, all of your, and not to say that I want you to eat eggs to clarify, I just telling you that it doesn't have saturated fat, like, but the yolk has, you know, almost 90 grams or milli, or whatever, uh, maybe 200 milligrams of, of cholesterol. So that's just telling you that eggs don't have saturated fat, but they do have cholesterol. So it's not that I'm recommending eggs. So it's just saying that all your animal products are going to have egg and the big two worst culprits are red meat and dairy. So um, those are the two things to think about. Um, it's really cutting out your saturated fat. The second thing you should be doing for your cholesterol, which is super important, is increasing your fiber. And the more fiber, I always tell people, the more you poop, the better you do, um, which is absolutely true. If you can bring down your, if you eat more fiber, you will not only improve your gut flora, reduce inflammation, but you will actually reduce your cholesterol. Your LDL cholesterol will go down. And that's been proven in studies by increasing your fiber intake. So you have to eat more fiber. And where do you get fiber? Well, you get it from green leafy vegetables and you get it from beans. And those are the kind of foods that you need to eat to increase fiber. So you have to eat fiber. And people often will say, well, if I eat grease greens, I get bloated. Or if I eat um, this, I feel uncomfortable or I get gas. Well, yeah. And the reason you do is because fiber does that. And most of it is because you have an unhealthy gut and it takes time to change over the unhealthy gut bugs to the healthy gut bugs. So it's not that you should stop eating those foods. You just have to maybe go slower and honor the process, but you still have to build up. Like you, you should think of gas and bloating as a sign that your gut is sick. Now it is possible that you can eat too much fiber and you can get more gassy and bloated. That's true. But most people aren't in that situation. Most people are in the situation where they're eating too little fiber and then they eat a little bit of fiber and they get bloated and they're like, oh, I can't eat that food. It's, it's I can't eat it. It makes me uncomfortable and they pull away. And I have many patients in my clinic and in my telehealth practice where they have either, you know, they have a lot of bacterial overgrowth and they've been told their whole life that they can't eat greens or, and, you know, that's, that's absolutely not true. I mean, so much of the time, it's just about a slow, deliberate, coarse, methodical uptake, up increasing of the amount of fiber. And that does take often the help of, of a physician but there's so much you can do um, in terms of healing your gut with eating fiber. Now, fiber, getting back to the cholesterol, is very important to reducing cholesterol. And so you really need to eat fiber every day, all day long. Now I'm fasting today, uh, and so I, I haven't eaten anything. So I know that, you know, today my fiber intake will be low, but in general, my fiber intake, you know, I eat so much fiber um, and I love it. And, you know, I don't have any problems with my bowels, that's for sure. Um, but I also don't have any problems with my cholesterol. That was more information than you probably needed. 
on my bowels. <laughs> um, let me ask you, first of all, I, do you have more slides? Because if not, I'd love to see you full screen. But if you mm. have more slides, just keep it on because I yeah. should have done that sooner. I was I was actually writing you through the chat, but because you want to see, I want to see big Dr. Agarwal. So oh, yeah, sorry. It doesn't, doesn't, uh, if I understand correctly, cholesterol, if, when you eat a lot of fiber, it, it cholesterol binds to it and it, that, that, is that what happens? So it helps absolutely it from the body. Absolutely. So uh, maybe I'll show, a. um, this might be sort of fun for people, um, to look at. I have a case here that I did, um, for the American college of cardiology. This might be kind of fun. Um, let me share that screen. So, all right. Um, and then remind me again, if I stop, if I'm just chatting, then to move to cancel, stop sharing. That's okay. So this, this is a fun uh, case that I did um, and I presented to a group of medical students or young doctors, I can't remember, but, um, and I, I think it's important to look at because I think it shows people sort of what we're dealing with in sort of the average patient. So and what are the risk factors? So this is a 56 year old Indian male who came in to, to assess his risk. And he didn't have any family history other than his father had a heart attack at 49. And there's an, those are his numbers. His total cholesterol is 245, his HDL is 45, his LDL is 145, his triglycerides were 275, and his non-HDL was 200. He had decent blood pressure, a BMI of 25, and his physical exam was unremarkable. So what's concerning in that story? Well, all of these things are concerning in this story, right? That he's 56, so he's over 50 or over 55. And the number one cause of sudden death over the age of 35 is actually heart disease. Um, and, you know, we put stents actually recently in a 29 year old. Wow. That seems so that, young. That was my youngest. I've never had one that young, um, but he had a massive heart attack and uh, we had to put stents in him and he did great, but at 29 years old. So this patient is 56. He's Indian. And if you're of Southeast Asian descent, you're at a uh, higher risk for many reasons. It is a polygenic uh, reason, but Indians in general and Southeast Asians do have higher, have, have a significant amount of heart disease. Uh, a lot of it's correctable with diet. Uh, he has a strong family history with a heart attack of 49 years old. His total cholesterol is high, his LDL is high, and his BMI is 25, which is in the overweight category. It is worthwhile to do your BMI, which is your body mass index, and um, noting if you were in the overweight category. And Currently, 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. So um, what we did was, I am not going to skip through those. I went through and I went through what we could do for this patient and, you know, sort of went through and I like this and I said, a heart, well, things you can't change. Well, you can't change your age. You can't change your family history. You can't change your gender. You can't change your own previous history. But there's, these are the things you can change. Blood pressure, sugar, BMI, chronic inflammation, diet, exercise, HDL, smoking stress, and total cholesterol. So there's so many things that you can do to change your diet. Now, the social factors are important. Environment, income, and social isolation are also extremely important. And I think income is a really important one to think about because uh, people often say eating this way is too expensive. So I think that's important to remember is that yes, food in general is expensive. But if you do a comparison of a bag of beans and a bag of rice to a McDonald's hamburger, fries and a shake, you're paying less with beans and rice and you're feeding a whole family and you're actually doing better. So right, like a bag of beans, like last time I checked, uh, you can get a bag of beans for $1.89. You can get a bag of lentils. Um, you can get a bag of rice for maybe a uh, a five pound bag of rice, probably for um, maybe five or $6, but five pounds is so much rice. So if you do one, you know, two cups of rice and a, and a, and a thing of lentils, like you can feed a family uh, a five, which I do often um, feed a family of five with brown rice and uh, lentils. Um, and you can get it all done in, you know, what, four bucks, five bucks. So um, I think that people don't realize that while income is a real issue, um, eating frozen foods to get the fiber content, eating, um, eating, um, 
yeah, if I, uh, and eating bags of beans and soaking things and pressure cookers. These are ways to sort of keep your costs low. So getting back to LDL cholesterol, again, reducing saturated fat is very important and increasing fiber. Those are two, if you eat, do those two things, maybe the other things are less important, which are many, which is activity. And if you, if you are more active, you can reduce your LDL cholesterol. If you are more active, you will actually increase your HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, which is what you want. You want to decrease your L and increase your H. So if you're more active, you do both. Um, yeah. And so that's another thing you want to do. Um, there are supplements that you can take that are out there that are natural ways to reduce your LDL cholesterol. Things like a citrus bergamot, um, which has some benefit in terms of reducing LDL, maybe about 10 to 11% reduction. Um, you can take red yeast rice, but I'm not a big fan of that um, because red yeast rice has been shown in studies to be extremely poorly controlled. Uh, and there's a lot of um, byproducts. So if you make, it's a mushroom based resin. And if you make, um, if you make it poorly, which people often do, then you can, um, create made a byproduct called citronin and citronin actually causes renal failure. And when this was studied, um, there was, uh, they did took uh, like 10 bottles of red yeast rice and they found like eight of the 10 bottles had citron in them, which is, you know, uh, a, a, a product, um, that we shouldn't be, you know, recommending. So I'm not a big fan of red yeast rice. So, um, but I think citrus bergamot, um, is okay. Um, there's a lot of conversation about niacin and garlic. Um, so just to talk about garlic, maybe a clove a day reduces your LDL about 10%. Um, the niacin on top of a statin has no benefit. It has a load of side effects um, because it makes you feel hot and flashy, hot flashy at night. Um, but it maybe it has some benefit in terms of reducing uh, LP little a, which is that lipoprotein um, and increasing HDL, but it never has been shown to improve outcomes. So while you may make your numbers look better, you don't necessarily make somebody better and they don't live longer. So I think that that's something to think about. Um, the ultimately the most optimal thing you can do is cut saturated fat. And, um, let's talk about cholesterol. So cholesterol, your body, there's a lot of arguments in the literature about cholesterol. Like if you eat less cholesterol, will your body just make it naturally? Yes. Um, but there is probably a threshold, right? Where you eat too much and then it starts, it's got to go somewhere. So, um, that's why I always caution people to not, uh, eat things that are high in cholesterol. Remember cholesterol only comes from animal products. And, um, so you will try, try to avoid your animal products as much as possible. And as I mentioned to you, the yolk of the egg is high in cholesterol. So we'd like you to avoid uh, that. Now, if you want to have an egg, um, once in a while, and it, it, it's just the white, I would probably be most happy with that. Um, if you were going to do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that it's also important to cut out simple carbohydrates. So remember carbohydrates are not the enemy, but simple carbohydrates are. And so people often say, well, I read a study that says saturated fat isn't the enemy, but carbs are the enemy. Well, it's not that one or the other, it's actually that they're both, like they're both bad. So saturated fat is really bad for you and simple carbohydrates are bad for you. So what's a simple carbohydrate? Well, fruit are actually simple carbohydrates, crackers, cookies, single sugars, those are all simple carbohydrates. So why do we say you can eat fruit and not crackers? Well, a fruit has fiber, it has nutrients that are multi vitamins and minerals, like there's nothing yes, you're getting a little bit of sugar, but it's packaged in this bubble of fabulousness, right? Of like all this fiber and vitamins. So eating, um, eating fruit is okay, but crackers and chips and cookies, cakes, they're just low in fiber and high in refined products. Like there's nothing good in there. And so those are the foods we want to avoid. So I like this slide, which is one that I like to show sometimes at talks. Um, See, did it come up? Let's see. It's funny the thing you said, the foods that we're trying to avoid are the foods that people really love to eat. 
I know. That but, but, you know, just because you love to eat doesn't mean like, you know, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself a question. And we, what we've done is we failed ourselves as a, a society because we feed these things to our kids and say, oh, it's okay when you're little. Um, and then, you know, you become addicted to these things and you really feel like you're losing out on stuff. But if you never feed children this way in the beginning, and then they don't feel this loss because really there is no loss here. You're only gaining if you don't eat those foods. But unfortunately, we've created a society based on sugars and processed foods. So this is a slide I really like. And the reason I like it, can you see this slide? Yeah, uh, it depends yeah. on what you replace it with. Yeah, so I'd like people to see, like, it's, you know, people always say, oh, saturated fat isn't the enemy anymore. It's the carb. Well, that's not true. It just depends on what you replace the saturated fat with. So if you take the saturated fat and you replace it with this simple, you know, no fiber pasta covered in cheese and whatever else is on there, I guess they put the basil on there to make you feel better. Um, and so if you put it on, if you eat that, well, you're going to make the person worse. But if you move the saturated fat and you move it to that bean, sweet potato, uh, wonderful medley of vegetables, which, you know, I'm hungry because I have fasting. So that doesn't look good for me. Uh, I mean, that's that's very tempting for me. Uh, but if you could move from that saturated fat to that plant based wonder on the bottom right, uh, then you're going to make people better. So I think that that's really important to, to see. And, you know, this is another slide to show that this is uh, nobody likes slides too much because it's overwhelming. But this is a slide that if you want to just show that you want, if the line in the middle is zero and you want to be on the left of the line, which means that you're reducing cholesterol by eating, eating these foods and you're reducing heart disease risk. So if you are on, if you're eating a saturated fat and you replace it with a trans fat, you make people worse. That's why it's on this side of the line. If you take a saturated fat and you put in a monounsaturated or a polyunsaturated fat, you make people better. If you take the saturated fat and you replace it with a refined carbohydrate, well, look what happened. We're back on the red side and you made people worse. If you take a saturated fat and you use a complex carbohydrate and whole grain, you make people better. So this is a really important concept that I think people don't realize. Um, uh, the other thing I like to sort of point out is where you get saturated fat, um, all animal products, the least of which is in eggs, uh, plant sources like avocado, nuts, coconut oil, palm oil, cocoa butter. Uh, so that's your chocolate bars uh, and shea oil or shea oil or however you guys, everyone likes to say that differently. Uh -huh. um, and so really thinking about that, um, the amount of saturated fat in a steak is 21 grams, uh, a Philly cheesesteak, 10 grams, hot dog, eight grams, cheese pizza, 7.5. So just to give you a sense that there's, you know, and that's, that's not your whole meal. I mean, that's so much more to it. And 21 grams of saturated fat in a steak. Uh, and this lastly, to remind you that less, you know, cholesterol, we want you to eat at least less than 200 milligrams per day. And that one medium sized egg has 186 milligrams of cholesterol in the yolk. So, you know, these are the things that I like people to sort of note, lots of nuts, uh, fiber, rich foods help. And the other thing to think about that brings and reduces your cholesterol or plant sterols and stanols, which you get from uh, plant-based foods. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Dr. Everall? We don't yeah. have a minimum daily requirement for saturated fat, right? I mean, it's okay not to have it at all. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, you know, yes, there, there's no minimum. Uh, you absolutely are not required to eat saturated fat on a daily basis in no way. Uh, if you want to eat a little bit of saturated fat, I mean, in an avocado or um, you know, you're getting it in that sort of blended, beautiful way in an avocado. Most people can handle a little avocado, but some people I have to restrict their avocados too, depending on how advanced their heart disease is, how inflammatory they are. And then I will maybe add it back later on. So plant sterols and stanols, you want to eat about two grams per day, but they're just coming from your fatty foods, like your fat, your healthy fatty foods. So you're going to get foods like your, your whole grains. And I always tell people really your lentils. So think of your lentils, your pumpkin seeds, your sesame seeds, your nuts, they're all going to be loaded in plant sterols and stanols. And that's really what we want you to eat. Uh, and um, that'll help you bring down your cholesterol. The uh, last thing I'll show you is another food, which is soy. Uh, and soy is a great food um, to bring down your cholesterol. Um, you know, Most people truthfully aren't going to get enough soy in their diet on daily, 
to reduce their LDL cholesterol, but it is absolutely a good way to bring down your LDL and certainly doesn't make things worse. And you don't have to worry about breast for, you know, making breasts in a man and breast cancer in a woman. And these are non-issues if you're eating unadulterated soy. Um, so those are the things I wanted to share uh, in terms of good, healthy ways to bring down your LDL cholesterol. Well, that, that was very helpful because I we get this question a lot about red rice yeast. And that, that's the first time I've heard somebody say, well, maybe it isn't so great, you know? Well, I mean, red yeast rice is the is the original product that we made into Mevacor or Lovastatin. And Lovastatin is FDA regulated. And so I always tell people, if you're willing to take red yeast rice, then just take a statin because this Mevacor in particular, which is what red yeast rice is, at least it's regulated and monitored so that you're not getting that byproduct citronin inside the product. Do other species have a need for saturated fat? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so that I can think of. Now, I don't know that... Uh, I can't say that, you know, true carnivores probably have some role for it, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. I'll ask my veterinarian next time yeah. I speak to her. You mentioned you were fasting today. Is this something you do frequently? Um, I do intermittent fasting uh, periodically, but I, um, or on a regular rather, um, but I off, I don't, uh, fully fast that often. Um, I use fasting for two reasons. When I intermittently fast, I really do that just to keep my stomach small um, because I do think that sometimes we can overeat and stretch a little more than we need to, especially as we age, right? So there, there's that reflex. So I should eat this much, but because that's what I've always eaten, right? And so you have this mental process, but I tend to do full fasts when I think that I'm inflamed. So if I'm worried about my inflammation, if I've had an illness recently, which I did, I got a, a bad virus from my daughter, which rarely happens. I rarely get sick, but I did get one. And then I felt like I was inflamed. Um, so I started to fast um, because I want to calm my inflammation down. Well, what's nice is your fast is medically supervised because you're a medical doctor. So <laughs> it's completely safe to do then. Yes. Yes. But, I'm, I, I'm, I heard, I'm conscious, always conscious and aware. But fasting, like I, I don't mean for people to do it at home, but like at the True North Health Center, for example, I've, I've heard people have improvement like with their LDL when they've done a water fast. Yeah. You know, I have mixed feelings about um, people that are fasting for very long periods of time. I think that there is a role for fasting, absolutely. Um, the problem with people that are doing these very extensive fasts is that they're, it's not that sustainable. And so um, I have people who come back from centers who've done these in there, they um, have gotten to the point, they're like afraid they've developed food anxiety. Um, and so I, I just, I think that there is a role for fasting. I'm just not a huge fan of these very long fasts, but there is there is data to show that when you fast, you know, you develop ketones. And so that's what's interesting about ketones potentially being more anti-inflammatory. I think we have a lot to learn about fasting and understanding it. Um, and I think when you're supervised, if fasting in a supervised fashion, you're okay, but I wouldn't do these prolonged fasts for sure on your own. Right. After, absolutely. Mind answering a few questions from viewers that have submitted them to us in advance? Sure. Thank you. We have, I think, about six. The first one is from Sheba. I have a follow-up question to last month's presentation. You mentioned that some famous people did not know that they had heart disease and had an inflammatory process that triggered a heart attack. What are some examples of these triggers? Can one fat meal, such as a fried food meal or pizza, trigger a heart attack? And what do you say to people who pressure elderly family members to eat deep fried food? I enjoyed your presentation last month. No, that's nice. Thank you, Shiva. So Shiva, I can tell is Indian. So yeah, I think- Yeah, last name sounds Indian. And yeah. Yeah, so I will tell you that being Indian and the cultural need to eat the fatty food and fry everything and push and encourage all this eating uh, is super tricky. So, you know, I, I'm Indian too, growing up in an Indian family um, and sort of navigating that without insulting is always a little bit tricky, but can be done uh, with kindness and humility. Um, so, um, so there are many um, people that have heart disease um, we have so many people with heart disease and they have no idea that they have it. 
And then there can be a trigger and to, usually that inflammatory trigger, it could be stress, it could be uh, often it's sort of some sort of stressful event, but could it be food? Yeah. So there was a study done at University of Maryland um, where they gave um, uh, people a McDonald's meal. I think it was a happy meal. And within four hours, they checked their endothelial function. So they checked the movement or the flexibility of the blood vessel before eating it. And then four hours later, and there was a significant drop in their endothelial function, like at four hours. So can you absolutely trigger inflammation and irritation in a short amount of time? Yeah. But I don't also want you to panic. Like every time I eat a piece of pizza, I'm going to have a heart attack. Like that also is not true. You know, overall, a little bit of here, there once in a while, you're going to be okay. The problem isn't the here, there once in a while, right? The, the problem is most people don't do the here, there once in a while. They do the here, there once in a while all the time, right? And so it happens to be too often, frequently, oh, I'll just once every week, five times, you know, oh, maybe just two times a week and then it's five times. Now, you know, Indians in general, they deep fry. I'm totally against it. They deep fry often in unhealthy oils. Um, Indians often will cook food and they will in, in heavy amounts of oil. So even though they're maybe eating vegetables, they're eating them in heavy amounts of oil, all of which I am against. Indian food is absolutely wonderful and beautiful and so tasty. Just, but eat the food, right? Not eat the oil, right? So there's so many ways to cook healthy Indian food uh, with little or no oil. Absolutely. I don't know if you know Broccoli Mom, but her sister-in-law is Indian and they wrote a delicious in oil-free Indian cookbook. And it's, mm. it's absolutely fabulous. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I, I, I just looked this up because I remember hearing about this when Tony Soprano, I mean, James Gandolfini, who played Tony Soprano died, that they posted and it's still there that his, he washed down two orders of fried king prawns and a large portion of foie gras with at least eight alcoholic drinks just hours before he collapsed in his Rome hotel room. Not such a healthy meal, huh? You know, I think there's so much tragedy out there and, you know, I never want to speak poorly. I think at the end of the day of someone else, I think at the end of the day, um, we are all victims to our own choices uh, for good or for bad. And, um, and sometimes you will do everything right and it'll still be wrong. So I don't think that I know the perfect solution for longevity I just know that there are many things that you can do to live longer. And that's what I focus on. And everybody does the best they can. I'm not here to judge anyone who doesn't do it right. I just do or wrong or to say that they did it right or wrong. I just know that there are certain things you can do to be healthier and you do with that information what, what you will. Thank you. This is from Jill. I hope I pronounced these medical terms correctly, but she asks, can Lambel's excrescences in the aortic valve be successfully corrected by surgery to clean out the fibers in the valve. TEE shows the valve works fine, but the lambels is causing strokes. Yeah. You know, uh, unfortunately, as far as we know, you know, sometimes we'll put people with lambels on a baby aspirin um, because those little fibers, you know, uh, are a problem. And Typically, you'll need surgery to, if you're having recurrent strokes, you will need surgery to have that scraped off the valve. Wow. It, it, that's not something you do, right? No, you will need a cardiac surgeon for that. Okay. Let's see. I got more, got more, more, more. Let's just find, there we go. This is from Nancy. Through following a whole food plant-based diet for the past number of years, I've lowered my total cholesterol from 237 to my current 118. I have a very high lipoprotein A of 164, however, which only came down 20 points by following the diet. My coronary calcium CT score is zero. How concerned should I be about the LP little a, and is there anything else I can do? Yeah, that's a great question, actually, and one that befuddles us right now. We're studying now we should have data in 2025. So your scenario is something I see every single day. Um, and for me, I would want to know your whole profile to see what else you have, what are some of the other lipid markers, your weight, your blood pressure, so many other things. So I could decide what to do. I would tell you if I was your cardiologist, just off the cuff, 
I would consider the therapy for you. Um, but I'm not sure, like I'd have to, see, like I said, I'd have to see those other things. Uh, calcium score. I don't, uh, did you say your, I don't know. Did she say her age? She did not. You no. don't even know her age, you know? No. So it's very hard to know. I can't make a sort of, um, instant decision based on the information that you've provided, but they are interesting dilemmas uh, where people who have reduced their LDLs. But I would tell you that I would aim for a much lower, higher, a lo much lower LDL than 118, even though you got it down. I love that. But I don't know what your LDL, I don't think she gave us the LDL, right? She, no, said, she, the total. Just said, she said 237 to 118, but it's 164 for her LPA. Yeah, so my guess is her LDL is pretty low, but I would want to know for sure that the LDL was low. I'd like to know what the HDL is um, to decide what I would do with this scenario. Uh, and I'd like to know her age. Okay, so Nancy, if you're watching, write us again and we'll ask Dr. Agarwal next month, okay? We want we don't want people to give too much information because then it's too long, but sometimes we do need a little bit more. Okay, I saw one uh, from Tina. This is again about the high LP little a. I have a very high LP little a. My cardiologist has told me he has no doubt that I will die from a stroke or heart attack. And it's awesome. Yeah, very encouraging. And it's okay. pushing me to go on a statin and anticoagulant. How effective is a whole food plant-based SOS free diet in managing risk? Yeah. Uh, the data has been sort of unimpressive with dietary change. I've seen even in my own study, a slight L LP little a reduction with diet. Um, but overall, we don't think there's a huge amount. I've seen some fluctuation in, in LP little a with diet, but I don't know if we know. Uh, I think that there's inconsistent data there. I think that um, LP little a is very complex and it is a very significant atherogenic particle. So it means it causes plaque and we have to take that seriously. Now, do they need to be on an anticoagulant, a blood thinner? I'm not sure. I'd have to hear the whole scenario. That seems maybe, I'm not sure if that's a pro indicated or not. Uh, would you need to be on a statin with an elevated LP little a? Again, I need to know the whole profile and know um, but if you have a high LP little a, it does put you at higher risk. And so I would want to know if you had a calcium score, what your age is, all the same questions. Uh, I feel these decisions are very individual and, um, there's just a lot that needs to be discussed. I do have a heart disease solutions workshop that I, I, you know, again, I'm not trying to uh, push my product or anything, but I do do, I did do a, a workshop on this that you can download online. Um, to go through sort of um, some of the heart disease solution ideas that might help because there's so many people with these kind of scenarios and something to think about. Uh, please feel free to promote. And if you give me the link, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I'd be happy to do that. And also if there's ways now, I know you practice in Florida. So can people only see you if they live in Florida and is it only in person or can they see you virtually if they live in Florida? Um, so I can see you in person or virtually, um, in virtual, the trick is, is that you have to, I can't take Medicare. Um, so that's tricky, right? So if, even if you're willing to pay out of pocket, because people always ask me that, um, I still cannot see a Medicare patient because I see Medicare in my clinic. Um, but I can see anybody who doesn't have Medicare and who, if you live in Florida, Maryland, California, um, Florida, Maryland, California, and New York. Um, and I was like, what am I forgetting? So um, those are the four states I can see patients in. So I can see patients on telehealth or I can, I do do those workshops because so many people have told me, I don't live in your state or I have Medicare. What can I do? And so I created those little, little kind of 60 to nine, I think they're 90 minute workshops to kind of go through heart disease, how to lower your cholesterol, all those topics. And I'm, I'm just putting together one about how to use nutrition for your heart. Well, please, please feel free to give me all those links. You have 4,000 characters to your disposal. Okay. Yeah, it says, my father and grandfather have both had open heart surgery and I have dealt with high cholesterol my entire adult life and I'm now 54. I've been whole food plant-based SOS free for almost two years now and I haven't been able to get my cholesterol below 225 even with exercise. And I exercise one to one and a half to two hours a day. Wow, six days a week. I eat flax with, and cinnamon with my barley for breakfast each morning and have lost over 40 pounds, but I'm frustrated with my numbers. Any tips for someone who feels they are doing everything right? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Again, you, I see a patient like you at least once a day. Um, so I hear you. Um, often people who have very high LDLs or high cholesterol, despite all the changes, they have a genetic predisposition uh, and you may not be able to get it down without therapy. Uh, and if you have a strong family history, like you're describing, uh, I would want to know, like, have you had any evaluation of your coronary anatomy? Like, have you had a CT calcium score uh, to see if you have plaque, um, depending uh, on some of those things? But your strong family history and your high cholesterol would bother me. Great. Thank you. Elaine says, Dr. Agarwal, I have mitral valve prolapse. Is there anything I should eat more of or anything I should eat less of? Mitral valve prolapse is um, is a congenital condition. It's a malformation. It's not something you did, um, and there's almost nothing you can do to make it better. It, at the same time, if you damage the valve with you know poor habits, then the wor the valve will worsen faster. So eating healthy and clean um, is really all you can do. Most of the time, mitral valve prolapse does not progress and people do really well with it. Uh, but there are some people who will need surgery in their future, but even then uh, people do very, very well. So not just, I don't know how significant it is for you, but if you're at the surgical space, then surgery is extremely well tolerated. If you're not in the surgical space, I would tell you that most people don't need surgery and do very well, uh, but there's almost nothing that there is to do other than eating clean um, and being active and putting less pressure on that valve that we can do for that. Great, thank you. This is from Susan. I'm a healthy 70 year old female on no meds. I've been vegetarian for 10 years and whole food plant-based sofa free since 2020. At my ophthalmologist visit while examining my dilated eyes, my eye doctor commented on how I must be taking very good care of myself. And later the optician during my refraction said my blood vessels could be seen during the exam and they look healthy. Is it possible to generalize the healthy state of my blood vessels in my eye to the rest of my body? That's a good question. So yes and no. I mean, there are some people who have a predilection towards certain blood vessels and we don't really understand why, like they can have advanced neck, neck disease, but for some reason they don't have heart disease, which is very interesting. So you can, and you can, it is very reassuring that you don't have eye, you have good eye health. And so, and if you have a good lifestyle, like you do, you're probably good. Uh, now it's, it's people there. It, could you have a little heart disease or a little bit of neck disease? Yeah, you could. Um, but overall, that's pretty re darn reassuring if you have that kind of lifestyle and that kind of eye health. Thank you. Rachel says, what is your opinion on starting HRT early in perimenopause to help protect the heart? So I wouldn't take HRT to protect the heart. I would take HRT if you have symptoms in the perimenopausal time related to like hot flashes or lack of sleep, hair loss, dryness, et cetera, if you need it, but that should be done with a cardiologist involved. I take that very seriously and I don't allow people to be on HRT unless I've discussed the case with them. Um, but it, you have to be very low risk um, in that perimenopausal time period. And then I would be okay with HRT. Um, at least for until you're 60 or 10, usually 10 years or until you're under 60. And I would consider it, but uh, those, I, I don't like that. I see gynecologists just starting people on HRT. Um, that's not the guideline and, you know, or rather our guide, that's not our guideline, um, which is that we want to be careful and cautious with HRT um, and that we need to understand your cardiovascular risk before we would start you on that or allow, you know, would, would we be comfortable using HRT? But I, with that in mind, I have many patients on HRT uh, in the perimenopausal kind of early postmenopausal time period. But again, these are conversations you need to have with your doctor. Do you worry about it even in people that are much older? Yes. You know, we do not want you to be older and taking hormone replacement therapy. Because that's so interesting, because obviously I'm not a doctor, but I've had several doctors on this show, and actually all three of them were urogynecologists, and they really recommend it because, especially for people like that are getting like chronic UTIs, for example. Yeah, so this is a constant dilemma, but, you know, I, 
I am okay with a few urinary tract infections. Um, and then there's also topical steroids, which are, I mean, topical hormones, which are effective in these situations. Um, and, but whether I want them to be on oral hormone replacement therapy, it really needs to be. Oh, they're um, recommending the the one you kind of shoot up your, you know, your thing. Up the vagina. Yes, yeah, sorry. so those, <laughs> your those, thing. <laughs> your coochie, your mm -hmm. vagina. So, okay. you, you know, vaginal uh, creams and th treatments are very different. Yeah. Um, oral hormone replacement therapy is what I'm referring to. Thank you for but, clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. So there are vaginal treatments that are very, um, you know, that don't have a significant systemic benefit or have any, any significant, significant, um, significant systemic issues with it. Um, but what, what, what I'm referring to is oral hormone replacement therapy. Thank you. Thank you for so much for clarifying one final yeah. question from Ariel and Ariel asks, I've been diagnosed as having venous insufficiency in my legs. My right leg is very painful after a re recent ultrasound. I was told my large vein, which runs from my ankle to my groin, is not working and the blood is not flowing back up my leg. Any advice on venous insufficiency? Yeah, I mean, again, this is a mechanical problem. This means that the valves inside your veins are damaged. It often happens from excessive weight. Um, it can happen with pregnancies and multiple pregnancies. Uh, it can happen because of bad, you know, genes, you know, like we can't change our parents. So these are the things that typically can cause um, malformations and I'm sorry, not malformations, damage to the veins and cause venous incompetence. The treatment for this is weight loss, taking pressure off your leg and your vein. But if it's significant and you're having pain, most likely the most important thing you do is you need compression stockings to make sure you help bring the blood out of your leg. So that you can relieve and cause, you can cause some relief that way. Um, but compression stockings are the key. Thank you. Well, this was great. Thank you so much. I, you know, I, 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 I'm going to just ask you this now, but I was going to ask you privately, but you know, if you say no, it's no big deal. I was thinking about that with all the doctors that we have with regular slots, more cardiologists than any other specialty. There's you, there's Dr. Baxter Montgomery, and there's Dr. Columbus Batiste. And the name of Dr. Batiste's show is called Heart to Heart. What if one day we got all three of you on one show and we can call it Heart to Heart to Heart to Heart? I love it. Yeah, uh, I love it. Well, you know, I love Columbus. I don't know Baxter as well. I've only talked to him uh, briefly once or twice, but I know Columbus very well. And so, and, and what I know of Cl Baxter, I'm, I'm sure it would be a delight to hang out with them and do a fun show together. Um, and you know, all of us, are, are, we're all pretty easygoing. Well, yeah, but Dr. Montgomery, I, I, he's very funny. It, you know, you may not, when you get to know him, he's hilarious actually. Oh, so good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Agrawal. Great to see you. Well, thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous plant-based doctor, Dr. Jim Loomis of PCRM, along with Karen Dugan. They have a show called The Chef and the Doc, and they're going to be talking about diabetes. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for watching.